Let's begin. Hey there, Scary Story Fanatics! Welcome back to Pleading Thought from Bone with your host, Sociopathic. Tonight, we walk along the trail of something a little bit more sinister than usual. So, prepare and get ready to buy your monitor screens for a brilliant little terrifying tale that I like to call The Evil Remains. Thick, stale, dusty air so abrasive to inhale that it induced a coughing attack the moment I stepped through the door. Nothing seemed out of place at first glance, and besides the concentrated layer of accumulated filth that enveloped every surface, nothing seemed out of order, just abandoned. I slowly plodded through each room giving it close visual inspection so as to maybe unearth some clues as to my friend's whereabouts. Upon searching the bedroom, I found the bed to be unmade and disheveled, but cold to the touch, serving only to fortify my current assumptions. Barry had not been here for some time. Where the hell had he gone? Why didn't he tell anyone where he was going? That he'd be doing whatever it was that he was up to. Thoughts fleeted through my consciousness. My attention warped around posers I had no answers for. I had promised his family that I'd find out what had become of him, but I was beginning to have my doubts, unsure if I'd be able to make good on my promises. Barry had recently graduated from college with a degree in organizational management. Being nearly a straight-A student and having a 3.9 grade point average, it wasn't long before some intelligent hiring manager for a respectable corporation offered Barry a job. In order to understand the context of the situation, the beckoning foundation for my current circumstances, you have to know Barry, understand him on a personal level. The police obviously did not, which is undoubtedly the reason for their general lack of interest in pursuing this as a missing persons case. They said, if there were any signs of a struggle, that would be a different story, but so far as we can tell, your friend seems to have simply dropped everything and left. If there are any developments, we'll contact you. In the meantime, try not to worry. Nine times out of ten, there's some sort of miscommunication between parties. If you're still concerned, maybe try the local hospitals again. Sorry we can't assist you any further. Have a good day, Mr. Morris. And like that, the cop schlepped me off like a completed form to be filed away in some cabinet, left to collect dust in the archives of what is a slowly moving judicial process that allows for no personal discretion. I couldn't really blame the cop. After all, he was just doing his job and fulfilling his responsibilities to a T. Even if he wanted to do more, the legalities likely would have prevented him from doing so. Sure, in those TV crime dramas, rogue cops break the rules all the time, pursuing personal agendas and avoiding punishment as long as the ends justify their means. In real life, situational happenstance has no place in any professional organization. A memory passed through my mind, making me chuckle slightly to myself out loud in the vacant, silent farmhouse, surrounded by dense conifer forests and a thick, metal-like field. 
I had learned that little business concept slash modern proverb from Barry during one of our late night chat sessions on Facebook. Barry certainly did study hard in school, frequently attempting to apply his newfound knowledge to just about any aspect of life in an attempt, as he said, to solidify the information that he'd been studying. When I think back on it, it was actually a really good idea, supported by Barry's high GPA. Barry was the kind of person to call his mom and dad on the weekends, and wish happy birthdays to old friends' Facebook accounts whenever the occasion arose. He'd never turned in a paper for class late, never once missed a day of work, and was as outgoing as anyone else fitting the bill. And that was the reason that I was here. You see, it wasn't rational for Barry to just drop everything and leave, without saying a word to anyone, especially now. Barry's mom had recently been diagnosed with terminal cancer. I know my friend. He would not have willingly abandoned his mother during such a great time of need. For months, he'd made sure to check in with her almost daily, texting me on a nightly basis as a way of unloading what's going on in his life. Then, about three months ago, contact with Barry got sporadic, infrequent, and increasingly spaced apart as time went on. It was as if he was preoccupied or buried in paperwork from the office. Some may have suggested, as the police did, that maybe he'd become depressed, overwhelmed by the pressure exerted on him as a result of his circumstances, a sick mother, and a stressful new job. But it was hard to imagine Barry becoming overwhelmed and beaten down by anything. I've seen this guy suffer a nasty breakup with his ex, a girl he believed that he would someday marry. But even after she cheated on him and subsequently left him, Barry never skipped a beat in his endeavors. Don't get me wrong, he was really broken up and noticeably broken on the inside. But God damn if it didn't even slow him down. If I remember correctly, he'd even passed a big exam later that week with an A. Something that I would have had immense trouble doing even if I were soaking in the utter placidity of a focus-facilitating lifestyle. And still, in an ever-decreasing outreach to any of the outside world, culminating to a point of unreachability as of two weeks and three days ago, I wasn't the only one who had not heard from him in a while. Barry's mom had tried contacting her son to deliver some benign updates regarding her condition, but had been unsuccessful, leaving several voice messages on Barry's cell phone voicemail and answering machine that kicked on after four rings on his landline. It was when Barry's voicemail inbox reached its platitude that she'd contacted me. I've been a real good friend of the family for years, nearly two decades by my account, and the woman's decision to try and get a hold of me thinking I might have solutions to the questions she sought after, didn't really come as a surprise. By the time we'd spoken, she informed me, her being listed under Barry's emergency contacts, that she received a call from Barry's employers, imploring her for answers regarding a stretch of absences. By the time she'd hung up, she'd made plans to contact the police in hopes of gaining some sense of situational resolve, with promises to provide some answers, given the police had already all but closed the case. I made plans for a trip out to Barry's new place. He described much of it to me after he'd moved in, but what I had envisioned within my mind's eye did not match what was reality. Not that there was anything strikingly contrasting between the mental prototype and its actual physicality, but it was just larger than I had imagined, and set in the middle of a desolate field, sprawling and expansive, surrounded by the skeletons of 
early spring conifers and a gray March sky. It appeared far more ominous. I'd expected to find the place in disarray or vacant, much like I did, but I didn't anticipate the accumulation of dust. Signaling that Barry had been gone much longer than a couple of days. Weeks, I'll bet. Must have been right after his last conversation with me. I thought to myself, instantaneously after walking through the unlocked, creaking front door and scanning my immediate surroundings. I'd been the last person to have received any form of communication from Barry, and although I didn't want to reveal it to his mom, he seemed a little more than off. He was usually upbeat, an optimist in almost any instance. I knew how close he and his family were, having all that American apple pie upbringing, so at first I assumed the odd context of his texts were due to his mother's illness and other stressors of varying degrees. The creaking floorboard beneath my right sneaker interrupted my introspection. My attention now pulled back to my surroundings. I had already searched the living room for clues passed over by incompetent policemen, even able to locate Barry's personal laptop upstairs in his bedroom, something I took with me for closer inspection later that evening at the hotel room that I had rented earlier that day. But now, well, deep in thought regarding exactly how I ended up here. I was making my way back through the living room and towards the kitchen. Dishes sat in perpetual weight, piled high in the sink beside an empty cup rack. Upon inspection, the cupboards revealed most of the dishes to have been used as well. I don't know why I decided to check the cupboard but I wanted to make sure that I had gone through absolutely everything, leaving no stone unturned, so to speak. The table was cluttered, and the linoleum floor soiled with grime. But I had found what I was looking for at the opposite side of the scullery. An old door whose white paint had cracked and worn over the years with the old house, looking as if the coating was the original. Honestly, a sight such as this is what I had envisioned in my mind. A typical fixture of most old, used farmhouses which had yet to be renovated. Barry had told everyone of his plans to fix up the place as the paychecks began to flow, but looking around, it didn't seem like he had done much of anything. This passing thought was supported by the loud creak of the door as I pulled it open by the knob. Before me was a stepped pathway leading down into the black, lightless bowels of the house, encompassed by ribs of gypsum and sinew of joint compound. It was an old, wooden staircase that threatened, with its appearance, to crumble beneath my feet if I dared place my full weight on any one of those steps. I first looked for a switch. One was to the right of me, pointing down towards the old plank steps, illuminated by a fading light beyond the windows behind me. I reached out with my index finger and flipped the switch upward. The cellar remained black unaffected by the position of the light switch. Fuck! The lights must be blown. I muttered under my breath, actually trying to reassure myself that something more malicious did not wait for me in the depths. Since I was young, I always had an intense fear of the dark. Sure, as a grown-up, I can sleep with the light off and all that, forgoing the need of the night light of my childhood, but dark, unfamiliar, enclosed spaces still pricked and crawled under my skin, like an infestation of irrational thought, undermining every 
everything the waking world has taught me, that there's nothing to fear in the dark. Luckily, I kept a flashlight in my car in case of a breakdown emergency, requiring some sort of nighttime roadside repair, irrelevant now in the modern world of AAA, and I decided it would be worth my while to head back outside and retrieve it from the trunk. I shut the creaking door with a slam and a click before I turned back to the direction of the main entrance. The old decking creaked beneath my feet as I crossed over it and descended two outside steps on my way to the vehicle. I fumbled around in my pocket with my keys, trying to locate the button that would pop the trunk without having to pull them out of my pocket. Various articles of clothing, the tire iron, and random bits of refuse were all shuffled around before I finally found the hefty black mag light that I had tossed in there a few months ago. I shut the trunk hard after I had turned on the flashlight and back off again, ensuring that the battery still worked. And they did. By the look of the ever-darkening sky and the looming presence of nightfall, I knew it wouldn't be long before I would require the use of the flashlight for every room of the house, if there was problems with the illumination in other parts of the home as well. I considered maybe the electric company had actually shut off the power to the entire house. I mean, Barry was only missing for a couple of weeks, and I didn't think that the electric company would make such a hasty shutoff to the service. It was conceivable that maybe Barry was behind on payments, and the cancellation of his service was in the making long before his disappearance. I smiled at the thought of my maglite all that much more. I looked up at the farmhouse before me once again, towering over me almost alive in its malign appearance. The front door was still open and swaying in the gentle breeze that rolled across the fields leading south. The gaping threshold reminded me of the mouth of a carnivorous beast, open and still, like the awaiting maw of a Venus flytrap, patiently biding its time for the unsuspecting to become the unfortunate. No one knew I was here, other than Barry's mother, and given her medical condition, she spent most of her time sleeping, recovering from bouts of chemotherapy. If something were to go wrong, I would in all likeliness be on my own. This thought in mind, I decided to cue the flashlight. Heading back inside, I felt as though the flashlight caused more harm than good. Reassuring in whatever was caught in its glow, but the impending doom just beyond its reach seemed more pretentious than ever. I couldn't get rid of the feeling of burning eyes upon me, examining my every movement, taking note of every breath and action. I felt like I was being watched, and the feeling only intensified as I grew further and further from the front door, deeper into the hollows of the archaic farmhouse. I'm still not sure if at this point, if the engulfing sensation was warranted as of yet, or if my own misgivings were getting the better of me. I could not shake the omnipresence of something staring me down. I knew I was supposed to be alone. I would not seen so much as a passing car for the last ten miles of the drive, nor seen one go by. Desolate isolation. Yet, somehow, the setting whispered to me, resonated in the feeling of being watched. Through the living room and the kitchen, retracing my steps back to the basement door, flashlight in hand, I deemed myself prepared to face the dark void beyond the steps leading down. Somewhat to my surprise, the steps did not collapse as I traversed over top of them, seemingly just supporting my weight, whining with creaks and moans in response to my 
moderate earth. The shine of the flashlight reminded me of a wide laser beam slicing through a darkness so thick that only the space caught within the ray would reveal itself for discovery. My feet landed upon a surface so copious with dust that it kicked up in dust clouds in front of me, the flashlight laser beam seemingly solid enough to use as a very large bludgeon. Something foul, almost painful to the nose, stabbed at my face with a pronounced odor. Burning char, like the inside of a fire pit the morning after a raging all-nighter. But there was something else, something just as intense and combined perfectly with the aroma of charcoal and embers. Sulfur. The thing was, the sulfur content was expected. Barry told me on many occasions that the house was fed by a well, high in sulfur content. It was okay for taking showers and washing dishes, etc., but far too tainted for drinking. Barry had to buy his water for that, procured during grocery trips in cheap gallon jugs. Ashes pile of ashes in the center of the floor, surrounded by a small, round stone enclosure, like a small-scale medieval forge burned out and awkwardly out of place. What the fuck was he burning down here? I thought to myself. I sifted through the pile with my hand, seemingly fresh. But as I kicked up clouds of ash particles into the luminescent beam, I noticed something obscure. The smell of char and ash did not crescendo with my increased proximity to the old forge-like pit. I scanned the rest of the cellar from where I stood, filling the details of each parameter within my memory. When the circle of light passed over the back wall, and I discovered two very significant objects of meaning. First, and instantly demanding my eye's attention, was a large, dark hole in the wall, large enough to walk into standing upright, and a black interior so pitch that the flashlight didn't reveal a single detail what was inside, swallowing up the light and giving nothing back. The second thing I did not see until I took my first step toward the strange wound in the cellar wall, laying on the floor and seemingly having escaped the fire of the nearby forge thing, edges blackened and singed. Seeing it as the light passed over it, its off-white appearance contrasted by the black and filthy floor, I bent down and picked it up. I couldn't make out what was presented on it, not because of the fire, but because whatever had been written on it, at least what was left on the small scrap of the piece that remained, was scribbled out. An occasional letter here and there, an A or a G, clearly identifiable, but the majority of it was unreadable. The only conclusion I could derive is that they appeared to be names, people or places, I'm not sure, but names nonetheless. I tossed the paper aside after checking the blankness of the other side and assumed it to be nothing of importance. My intention was now returned to the cavernous archway, broken into the face of the back wall. 
I half expected something to lunge at me from within the darkness, my toes readied in preparation to help me jump backwards on a dime. But as I slowly approached it, nothing happened. In fact, I discovered this gaping hole in the wall led absolutely nowhere. Its jagged rocky walls seemingly painted black, but upon investigation via touch, charcoal. The entire surface area of the space, no more than six feet deep, was covered in a thick black soot, facilitating the facade of swallowing light and presenting the true source of that powerful charcoal-like smell in the cellar. I saw that it went nowhere. I even graced my right hand across its innermost surface, physical feedback of solid rock and blackened earth. I knew nothing was down there with me. I'd seen nearly every inch of that basement with my own two eyes now, but that feeling of being watched welled up inside of me until I began to almost feel violated, as if I was being sized up like a piece of meat. Something was wrong, and my instincts were screaming at me to run. The sense of dread was so strong, it was nearly palpable. It was time to leave, hastily. I turned in the direction of the creaky stairs with the intention of running to them, but it was too late. An impossible, rumbling growl from behind me, from the crevice that I had recently inspected and found empty. I jumped around to face whatever made that terrible sound, and shock overshadowed fear, disequilibrium forcing me to remain, comprehending the sight before my eyes. It was... It was Barry, though I did not fully recognize him at first. At first glance, it was just a blackened shape, humanoid in appearance, and slightly a lighter shade of black, a very dark gray, assisting in the outline of his features against the charcoal backdrop. His hair was messy and frayed, thick with the same soot that seemed to cover his body from head to toe somewhat masking the appearance of him not wearing any clothes at all. He said nothing, his face expressionless, as if he even failed to see me. But he, he had to see me. Barry? I called to him, slowly lifting my flashlight to his eyes. Two glassy, black, pearl-like eyes that were the darkest, most blackest things that I had ever laid my eyes on. More pitch than any of our surroundings, blacker than the light-swallowing, charcoal-lined hole in the wall. They were the last thing I saw before he lunged at me, sinking his sullied teeth into my flesh, in my neck, and consciousness slipped my grasp. It's now the following day. Once I woke up on the floor of that old cellar, I methodically made my way back to my car and started the engine. Pulling away, not giving any mind to anything that I may have left behind. I intend to pay Barry's mother a visit. She was expecting to hear from me after all. But... I had no intentions of polite conversation or divulging my experiences or what I had found. Just as the whites and colors of my eyes washed away, leaving no trace of anything but glassy voids within my sockets, I feel as though all goodness has left me, and only evil remains. Well, I suppose when you go looking for evil, you don't always find it. Sometimes it finds you. But hopefully you find me again next weekend as I have more horror to deliver. 
And until then, remember to like, share, subscribe, and turn on notifications so I can catch you all again next Saturday. <laughs> <laughs>